Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to everyone joining us here at Trinity Presbyterian Church in present and online. Uh, if you're with, there will, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, there will be no evening worship this evening, but next Sunday there will, and we will be meeting in person. We're going to be coming back here for evening worship Sunday, July 5th at our regular time, and we'll be meeting in the, we won't be meeting in here, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall. We're going to break down those tables and set up chairs. So morning worship in here next Sunday, evening worship down the hall. Perfectly clear, right? All right, unless there's any other announcements, uh, let's turn to the worship of the Lord. All right, pray with me. Lord God, we rise up and acknowledge that you reign over all things this morning. And you sit, Lord Jesus, you sit at the right hand of God the Father and see all, and see all things that go on in this world and this universe today. Uh, and yet you pay particular attention to us this morning. Heavenly Father, when you come down, know that you will find nothing, nothing praiseworthy in us. Heavenly Father, you will find nothing recommending us to your consideration. But we gather here at your command, feeling, that, feeling the warmth of your presence already, and knowing it's solely because of your mysterious love for us, which we thank you for. Shower it upon Heavenly Father, since you're going to be here, Savior, since you're here among us, then, then pour that blessing down upon our heads. Let us, uh, let us receive your grace this morning and go out forever changed uh, for what happens over the next hour here. Lord God, bless us as we sing. Bless us as we pray. Bless us as we preach and hear the word preached. Bless us as we, um, as we go forth and rest and prepare to work. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the call to worship, Psalm 119, beginning at verse 137. This is the word of the Lord, it is eternally true. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. You have commanded your testimonies in righteousness and exceeding faithfulness. My zeal has consumed me because my adversaries have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's sing Psalm 19. Oh. 
kneel for our prayer of confession. Father, we have sinned. We have all sinned. We've come short of the glory of God, for the God in whose hand is our life breath, and all our ways we have not glorified. Against you and you alone have we sinned and done much evil in your sight. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in your laws which you have set before us, though they are holy, just, and good. Father, we confess our pride, allowing it to work within us, the breaking out of passion and rash anger, our covetousness, and love of the world. Father, our sensuality and pleasing of the flesh, our false sense of security and trust in the things of ease, being unprepared, not at the ready, our fretfulness and impatience, groaning under our afflictions, our unwarranted distrust of you, God, and your providence, our lack of charity towards our brothers, particularly our own relatives, neighbors, friends, and perhaps the injustice we've committed towards them. Father, our tongue, and Lord, our spiritual slothfulness and decay. While these are broad, Lord, we have individual sins that we silently name and lay before you now. Father, we acknowledge the great evil there is in sin, our very sin, and ask you to help us to aggravate these sins, to take notice of those things which are heinous in your sight. Remind us of the coming judgment, that we would rightly judge our sin according to your word. We glorify and honor your patience with us, your long suffering as you bear with us, your created, that all should come to repentance and are reminded that you have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. We humbly profess our sorrow and shame for these sins. We ask you to give us the boldness and strength to engage ourselves that we will not only mentally assent that we will be better, but Lord, that we would also do those things to be better. We ask you to protect our every thought, word, and deed so that the fruits of righteousness may be produced, and that sin shall not have dominion over us. And it is in your name, your Son's name, Jesus Christ, we confess. Amen. Please rise and hear the following scriptural assurance from Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to give praise to God by singing, Lord, we confess our numerous faults.
Lord, we confess our numerous faults, how great our guilt has been. How vain and foolish are our thoughts, how all our lives were sin. But oh, my soul, forever praise, forever love His name, who turns your feet from dangerous ways. Tis not by works of righteousness which our own hands have done, but we are saved by God's free grace, abounding through His Son. Tis from the mercy of of his death who hung upon the tree the spirit is sent down to breathe on such dry bones as we raised from the dead we live anew and just be seated. Let's turn to Job chapter 13 for our Old Testament scripture lesson. Job chapter 13. This is in the middle of of one of Job's responses to his unhelpful friends, and I think in the middle of it, we, uh, we receive a key to Job's complaints in verses 15 and 16. He explains what's going on. He says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him, right? And we think, well, arguing before God, you know, what, uh, what a fool's errand. But then he goes on, he says, This also will be my salvation, for a godless man may not come before his presence. Right? But the godly man can come before God's presence, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and he can make his complaint before the Lord. And so I, this is an indication of Job's righteousness and an indication that it was right for him to take his complaint before the Lord. And legitimate for him as a son of God to be able to do that. This is the word of the Lord. It is eternally true. Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue with God. But you smear with lies. You are all worthless physicians. 
Oh, that you would be completely silent and that it would become your wisdom. Please hear my argument and listen to the contentions of my lips. Will you speak what is unjust for God and speak what is deceitful for him? Will you show partiality for him? Will you contend for God? Will it be well when he examines you? Or will you deceive him as one deceives a man? He will surely reprove you if you secretly show partiality. Will not his majesty terrify you and the dread of him fall on you? Your memorable sayings are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. Be silent before me so that I may speak. Then let me then let come on me what may. Why should I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. This also will be my salvation, for a godless man may not come before his presence. Listen carefully to my speech and let my declaration fill your ears. Behold, now I have prepared my case. I know that I will be vindicated. Who will contend with me? For then I would be silent and die. Only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide from your face. Remove your hand from me and let not the dread of you terrify me. Then call and I will answer, or let me speak, then reply to me. How many of my iniquities and sin are how many are my iniquities and sins? Make known to me my rebellion and my sin. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? Will you cause a driven leaf to tremble, or will you pursue the dry chaff? For you write better things against me. And make me to inherit the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks and watch all my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet while I am decaying like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now Mark chapter 7. grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating with their, eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of man, men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say... If a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many such things as that. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable, and he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart? but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he, and he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Seraphonician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demons having left. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said, Aphaphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let's now bring to the Lord his tithe and our offering.
This morning, let's stand for the reading of our sermon text. Psalm 33, this is the word of the Lord. Sing for joy to the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. O God, our Father, we call upon you Since all fullness of wisdom and light is found in you, mercifully enlighten us by your Holy Spirit and the true understanding of your word. Give us grace to receive it in true fear and humility. May we be taught by your word to place our trust only in you and to serve and honor you as we ought so that we may glorify your holy name in all our living and teach our neighbor by our good example rendering to you the love and and the obedience which faithful servants owe their masters and children their parents, since it has pleased you graciously to receive us among the number of your servants and children. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So Psalm 33, another psalm. And... It is undoubtedly true that the the Christian faith is a singing faith. It's a singing faith, right? Uh, In the middle of the word of God, there is a hymnal, right? We have the book of Psalms. The acts of God have been commemorated in song. We, We come across these throughout the pages of scripture, such as the song of Moses, the song of Miriam. When Solomon dedicated the temple, which we read about in Second Chronicles 5, the chapter um, I, I have on the wall of my office. I have a, a, a picture of J.S. Bach's Bible at this chapter, Second, Corinth, or Second Chronicles 5. And in the margin, you see he put a note. And he said in the note that this is the, the, the foundation of all godly music the foundation of all godly Christian music, something like that. But in that chapter, uh, the Levitical singers were commanded to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify the Lord, saying, He indeed is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. That's what they said continually before the Lord. The prophets are said to have, you may not know this, but the prophets prophesied with musical instruments. 
There's several times we come across that and what that means. Uh, I think it means just what it says. You prophesy with musical instruments by doing what prophets do, which is uh, telling forth the word of God. Uh, we read of the apostles and Jesus who sang together after the Passover meal that they celebrate just before Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, the apostle Paul commands us to teach and admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. In the final book of the Bible, we are given a glimpse into the uh, throne room of God and what is taking place in the throne room of God. Musical instruments are accompanying loud, resounding worship and singing. So there's really no way, if we read our Bibles, to get around the fact that uh, the Christian faith is a singing faith, right? We are, we are not merely to think as much as the Reformed Church thinks that that's all we should do, right? We are not merely to speak or even to read. We're not merely even to pray. We're not merely even to hear. We are also commanded to sing. And so whether you like it or not, Christian, you're a member of a choir, you're a member of a choir every Sunday morning as we join our voices together. And that call to sing is the focus of this, the first section of this psalm. It says, sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy for the Lord. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. When we sing, we are gilding the lily, so to speak. Right? You know what that phrase means? It means to, the lily is already beautiful, but when you gild it, you make it ridiculously beautiful. When you put the gold leaf on a lily. And so we take... Words which are beautiful, which have doctrinal content, which um, in the case of the Psalms are inspired words. And we beautify them by singing those words, by expressing those words through, um, through song. We're joining our voices and proclaiming truth beautifully and powerfully. So often in pagan religion, music and rhythm are used... But they're used in a different sense. Pagan religions are used to draw you inward, right? To draw you inward, to draw you into a state of, of, of um, a, a trance state, right? But we, we sing outwardly. We sing with an object in mind. Um, you think of the prophets of Baal who cut themselves and raved until evening asking their God to bring fire down from heaven. You can almost hear, at least I do in that passage, though it's not mentioned, so I'm, I'm speculating here. You can almost hear drums pounding as they're raving and cutting themselves, right? As they cry out with loud voices, and they receive no answer. Though we don't read of, of music in those verses, we've seen and heard pagan rituals where the music is meant to put somebody into this trance state. Not so in the Christian faith, right? We sing not to sink inward. We sing to lift up praise to, to God who is enthroned on high, who is enthroned in heaven. We announce to the world the glory of his name, and we do so with words beautified with pitches and rhythms and, and timbres, right? Different sounds of instruments. And God is pleased when we do so, when, when those words that we sing come forth from our mouths, having been born by faith in our hearts. And the love and awe we have for our great God. He is pleased when we sing by faith, with strength, and do uh, and appropriate to his glory. The psalmist says, sing for joy. He says, give thanks. 
He says, sing a new song, not an old, dead, faithless song, but a new, fresh song. Right? He says, play skillfully. He says, shout for joy. Sing for joy and shout for joy. Not that it does, you know, note, note that it does not say mumble because of your lukewarmth. Mumble because you're embarrassed that somebody's going to hear your voice. It says shout for joy because God is glorious. Shout for joy when you sing the praises that God deserves. We're to shout. You men are pathetic. I can pick on the men. You men don't draw hardly half a quarter of a breath into your lungs to sing before God. He, des he deserves you going and taking it all the way in so that you can shout. His praise. His glory deserves it. You boys. I've been in churches where the boys are the loudest singers of the church. Christ the Word in Toledo, the boys sang. And it was wonderful. Right? It was wonderful. It was so encouraging to the pastor who had to get up and preach. It was so encouraging to the elders who had to get up and confess sins to hear uh, young men singing, right? It it does not say in this passage, read along while other people sing. Meditate on the words silently as other people sing the words to God and to his glory, right? It, 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 there is discipline to music, isn't there? There's a reason why we sing psalms and hymns and songs with loud instruments and new melodies and drums and a a strong male voice in the lead, and that's to discipline our, our cold, right, quiet hearts. It's to discipline our, our embarrassment at singing God's praises. It's to discipline us so that we move toward exuberant and loud, yes, loud praise of God. It's so sad when Christians get offended about loud music. It's the most pathetic excuse I've ever heard about worship music. Oh, those, those electric guitars, they're too loud. Do you know how loud the worship was in the temple? When they had loud resounding cymbals, when they had hundreds of voices and, and hundreds of trumpets blasting in the air. I mean, all of the elders' wives would have been complaining, right? That's what would have happened. And, and it's just, it's sad because I think it's an excuse for our lack of zeal. It's, it's really an excuse for us not really knowing just how glorious God in heaven really is and what kind of praise he deserves because of that, Right? Some of us refuse to be disciplined by the music, so we mumble and we take short breaths and we think about other things while the rest of our brothers and sisters around us are doing the hard work of making sure that God is honored by what's coming out of your throats. Now, it's undoubtedly true that when we mumble through the, our praises of God, we are not appropriately responding to God's glory. The reason our praises should be shouted and joyful and accompanied with loud and resounding symbols and not wimpy is that God's glory is deserving of much better. In fact, God's glory elicits much better. The only reason we, we would be cold in our worship is because we have a false notion of God's power, of God's glory, of God's immensity of God's eternity, right? And so we think, well, God's worthy of, of mumbled praises. I don't see him often. I don't see his power demonstrated, right? He's an afterthought. You know, I'm more passionate right now about what I'm going to have for lunch than I am for the Lord God Almighty. And so as my stomach growls, I really just can't sing loud. Can't do it. I mean, guys, 
I'm, I'm obnoxious. Okay, I'm obnoxious because I know my own sins. I know what you grapple with because I grapple with these same things, right? I know the wickedness of my heart. I know how cold it can be when I come into worship. And I know how something one of my kids said to me before I come to worship can cloud everything that happens in the worship service. During my whole sermon, I'll be thinking about what that child said or didn't say or refused to do, right? And so let me push you. God's glory elicits much better than mumbling. The only reason we would be cold in our worship is because we're diminishing God in our minds. Why do we think it is appropriate to mumble praises to God who is from everlasting to everlasting, whose glory fills the universe? Remember the psalm last time I preached, Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. When our praise is distracted, when it's weak, when it's mumbled, when it's heartless, and especially when it's faithless, we are not ascribing to the Lord the glory due his name. Rather, we're announcing how unworthy he is of any of our strength. We are demonstrating to everybody around us that the glory of the Lord is much less than the glory of our favorite sports team or favorite politician. Dear brothers and sisters, the worship of the Lord should be the height of your week. The time in which the depth of your emotions is unloosed, is engaged in the worship of God. And that's not at all a statement about the charismatic church. It's not at all a statement about Pentecostalism and, and things like that. That is an exhortation to reformed brainiacs who won't even lift their arms in worship. Okay? This, when we come together to worship, it should be the most potent mixture of physical and intellectual engagement that we ever experience in our lives. Right? Why? Because God. Because God is the object, because God is there, right? Because your praises are not self-referential as much as your embarrassment to sing loudly makes you think they are, but rather your praises have as their object the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the everlasting triune God who created the heavens and the earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the God who is mighty to save, the bright morning star, the ancient of days, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the object of your praise. It is undoubtedly true that if our praises are weak, our knowledge of God is correspondingly weak. Right? That God is and that he is such a God and our God, ours forever and ever, should awake within us an unceasing and overflowing joy to rejoice in temporal comforts is dangerous. To rejoice in self is foolish. To rejoice in sin is fatal. But to rejoice in God is heavenly. That's what Charles Spurgeon says. We're to shout joyfully to the Lord because as it says in verses 4 and 5, God's mercies are constantly surrounding us. For the word of the Lord is is upright and all of his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. And that word loving kindness is a Hebrew word chesed. You got to do the, the guttural at the beginning, chesed. And it means, it's, it's a deep and rich word. And it, it's all throughout the Old Testament. But it means mercy, it means but it's like this, this cosmic and eternal and deeply abiding mercy, right? The, that, that abides in God's own character. And so the NASB translates it loving kindness. Um, combine that with mercy, and I think we're getting close. Because the earth is full of this mercy, full of this hesed, we should be shouting praises. 
right? Young men and women, you should draw deep breaths into your lungs when you sing and let some volume come out from your vocal cords, please. That is only appropriate for God's glory. And, and you know what? To hear anybody sing loud encourages me about the state of their soul. I mean, it's almost an instant indicator of somebody's, either the state of their soul or whether or not they've fallen into some sort of habitual sin that they struggle with. It is hard to sing the praises of God when your heart is racked with guilt and is heavy. Many of you young men particularly can fall into this um, mocking of others when they give themselves to worship, right? Especially young men. Young men just love to mock one another. And, um, and just with the look of the eyes, when somebody is singing loudly, just with the look of the eyes, you can mock somebody. And if I ever see it, I will be sorely disappointed with any of you young men that do it. God's glory demands that you shout to him in worship. It is the wimpy and the mumbling and the embarrassed and those who care about what the people around them think about them who are dishonoring God. Dishonoring God. Bringing to him blemished animals for their sacrifice of praise. And do you really fear man more than you fear God? You really fear man more than you fear God. Well, I can tell by the way you sing. I can. So that's the first thing. From the exhortation to sing, the psalmist takes us to the contemplation of God's power in creation. He writes, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps and storehouses. Let all the earth Fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The reality of God now creating everything out of nothing just by speaking should lead, as the psalmist says in verse 8, to fear of him. We should fear him because he's done this. Why? Because if God can create the earth, the sun, the Milky Way, the galaxy, the, the distant nebula, you know, the minutest part of the atom. If he can make lights, if he can make angels, if he can make men, then there is nothing that is impossible for him. If he can speak and create worlds, he can also speak and destroy a man instantly. He speaks and it is done. He commands and that is undoubtedly what must happen. He is in that sense an unequaled power. He does not derive his strength from somewhere or someone or something else. He does not have to get permission to do what he wants. He does not have to struggle to get anything done and endure frustration because of the effects of the fall. No, he does all his holy will ever so easily. He speaks and it is. He commands, it's done. Is it not obvious why this should lead us to fear? Right? Is it not obvious why this reality should lead you to be in awe of him? This is why it leads to fear. This is why it should lead to fear. This is why you should fear God, because no one resists his will. No one resists his will. That is impossible. There will be no one who can boast before God. We do like to take credit for our successes and our intellect and our ability to argue and our children's accomplishments, but what do you have that you have not received from his hand? And ultimately, this means that there is only one reason why a man is saved or condemned. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. 
His power causes us to fear him because in his power we recognize that our eternal destiny depends entirely upon his benevolence. And we have sinned. And so he has every reason to crush us. An action that would lead him to no remorse whatsoever because he is holy. We know that our forgiveness is entirely dependent upon him. And knowing that, we fear him. We fear him. We tremble before him and go about continually repenting when we sin because we stand before him unworthy to receive any kindness from him. And amazingly, he is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. In Jesus Christ, he redeemed us and made a way of escape that we might not be condemned to hell for our sins. The knowledge, the knowledge that he has created everything visible and invisible shuts our mouths, right? It ceases our striving. It makes everything we've ever accomplished. I mean, think about the things you've done. Everything you've ever accomplished seems as nothing. It absolutely crushes our pride. It destroys us. And when we are naked before the gaze of a holy God, the only proper response is fear. Just as the glory of God should lead us to praise him, the power of God should lead us to fear him. Think of the pride of man for just one moment. Think of our pride. Think of the pride of mankind. Outside of Christ, all hate God and refuse to acknowledge him as God or give thanks to him. It doesn't matter whether that person is rich or poor, white or black, Republican or Democratic, smart or dumb, right? They all set themselves up against Almighty God. And the preeminent way they do this is by worshiping themselves instead of worshiping God. And the way we worship ourselves is by attributing to ourselves, guess what? The characteristics of God. And so every man writes his own scripture, gives his own explanation of the origin of everything, sets down his laws and determines his own way of salvation. And so today all that boils down to obeying one's feelings. Feelings. Their scripture is whatever makes them have some self-esteem. Whereas scripture tears a man down and destroys him before God and makes him naked. For some, that scripture means that it was, they pick up books written by Marx or they pick up books written by Nietzsche or Hefner or Coates, right? That man goes on, he explains that his origin is from impersonal forces of nature over the course of billions of years, whereas scripture teaches a personal, intensely interested God speaking the world into existence. That man who worships himself, explains that he is the arbiter of what is good and right and fashions laws that allow for his vices. Whereas the law of God exposes man's sin. And that man determines that the way of salvation is to enact what he considers to be justice and equity like the redistribution of wealth and the enforcement of radical egalitarianism. Whereas scripture tells us we're dead. We are dead in our sins and we need salvation from outside of us. So the pride of man is putrid. It is 
particularly putrid in light of the absolute power of Almighty God. As Macbeth says, man struts and frets his hour upon the stage that is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Nothing. And yet one generation to the next struts and frets, refusing to bow the knee to the God they know is there, refusing to acknowledge his power. They have no fear. Christians, that can't ever be or become your posture toward God. If you have forgotten his power, you better get yourself into worship and sit under the preaching of his word where he announces his will. Get yourself into his word and scripture and restore your fear of him who has the power to cast both body and soul into hell. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up. At verse 10, we learn that the power of God is not just over the individual, but that God's power rules nations. It rules nations. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plan of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. We have a tendency probably not unique to our time, to over-inflate the importance of the nations. To over-inflate the importance of the nations. The power of nations is quite impressive. Right? It is impressive. Think of the expanse of the Roman Empire. Right when, when Rome fell during Augustine's time, the world was astonished. The world was in awe. How could, how could Rome fall? And you know what the pagans did? They blamed the Christians for the fall of the empire. And so that's when Augustine wrote the city of God to refute that charge. It's because of your sin, he says. Likewise, today, the, the riotous behavior today is being blamed on Christians and the Christian heritage. This is why, this is, this, is, this is the way of nations who do not have God as their Lord. They cannot tolerate dissent because of their smallness of mind, and so they turn on the Christians and attempt to create a culture after their own image. Forget this culture made after the image of God and his law. We will create a culture that goes after what we want in our own image. And the nations go on raging while the eternal God still sits enthroned over all those nations and he laughs at them. He laughs them to scorn. They are just drops in the bucket. They are here and then gone. They rise up and fall down. Just as God with a word can create galaxies without any effort, without any expending of strength, God can nullify the counsel of nations and frustrate the plans of people. Kingdoms rise and fall by God's decree. They come and go, and maps are constantly in a state of flux. But do not forget that the power of the nations, which indeed seems so immense to us at times, is nothing compared to the power of God. The USA has drones. That can do a lot of damage. Even nukes, right? That could take out entire countries. But God can shake the heavens and the earth. Infinitely more important than the alliances we make with other nations is to have God benevolent toward our nation. What is undoubtedly true is that history is superintended by God who intends to bring everything to an end. You know that? He intends to bring everything to an end. And what is his end? It is to glorify himself. He will bring everything to an end 
so that his glory and greatness is exalted. His counsel stands forever. It is not momentary like the Roman Empire, the British Empire, or the nations of the earth, including our own generation to generation enacts God's will. He is the one king. The knowledge of God superintending the nation should give us comfort. It should give us comfort. It should give us the kind of patience that can be calm even when the order we once enjoyed is being removed from us. God knows God is acting. God knows and God has set his favor, particularly on his bride, the church. They are there. The church and her people are a remnant from every nation that have an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So there is a sense in which we can sit back and observe what is going on without getting our undies in a bundle. There's also a sense in which we can continue our work of speaking truth to powers of the world, whatever the consequences may be. Right? John the Baptist lost his head for it. And we may too. But God knows what is happening. Doesn't that help you? Doesn't that give you some sort of rest? The question is not what should we do, but what is God doing? Well, he's doing what is mentioned in verse 11. He's guiding his children to their inheritance. He's guiding his children to their inheritance. You have an amazing inheritance laid up for you in heaven. And God is guiding you to it. His choice is being worked out very intricately through every age of man's existence on this planet. Now, the psalm then turns to consider God as he looks down on mankind, right? God has to look down on pitiful little mankind. Notice that his vantage point is heaven. And that there is no one hidden from his eyes. He sees everyone. Where God lives, he sees all the souls he has made. And he knows each of you, each soul, very intimately. He knows what lies in our hearts. He knows our hidden thoughts. He knows the quality of all of our works, which amount to filthy rags. He knows all of our pride and thinks it is insulting that he would, you know, and, and we think it is insulting that he would say our works are but filthy rags. We're kind of proud of them. He knows us as we are, not as we think of ourselves in our deluded and sinful minds. No one man is a gift to mankind. There is not a single gift to to mankind, among mankind. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And from God's vantage point in heaven, God looks at the leaders of the nations, our presidents and our kings and our governors. Everything those leaders are prone to boast about, God says those things are nothing. Mighty armies, great strength, Horses. In today's terms, we would be talking about our armies, our drones, our tanks, our satellites, our ships, our bombers, etc. God looks down on all that military might from his position in heaven. And remember, he is the one who spoke the worlds into existence and the power of even our nuclear weapons compare to him like the power of a mosquito to an elephant. And maybe that's making too much of the mosquito. The psalmist has said that the nation is blessed whose God is the Lord. In fact, if God is our God and he is willing to protect his people, then and only then will a ready military and an arsenal and warships mean anything at all. Right? If we learn anything from the Old Testament at all, we should learn that God is the one who raises up and brings down nations. And it does not matter how wealthy, how mighty, how old, or what kind of heritage those people have forsaken. As Mary says in her Magnificat, 
He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who are humble. That's what God has done. So what are the righteous to do? What are Christians to do to ensure God's favor toward our nation? Well, the first thing to say is it's God's prerogative, whether we know his blessing or not. It can change from moment to moment and likely will change given this, the blood that runs through our streets. Well, we could take the Hezekiah option. As Christians, we could take the Hezekiah option. You remember Hezekiah? He, he cried out to the Lord. The Lord gave him glorious military victory, right? Astonishing, killed the Assyrians. And then he, it's revealed to him that he's going to die. And Hezekiah is healed by, um, by a balm. And the Lord says, I'll give you 15 more years. And then I think it's the Egyptians come, and it's not the Egyptians. Who is it? The Assyrians? Babylonians. I think it's the Babylonians. Yeah, the Babylonians come, far off nation come, and, and, and Hezekiah opens up the vaults for them, shows him all, all their wealth. He opens up, boasts about all this wealth, shows him everything in the kingdom, and then the prophet comes to him and says, oops, shouldn't have done that. You really shouldn't have done that. And then the destruction is prophesied. And you know what Hezekiah says? Hezekiah has sons. He has children. He says, well, it's good what the Lord says as long as it goes well in my day. He's not thinking of the future. He's not thinking of his children who are going to be dragged away into exile right, and enslaved. He's not thinking about that at all. He's just happy that, you know, for the balance of his days, things are going to be peaceful. And so we could sort of take that approach. We could say, look, let's just try to hold things together until, until this generation dies. And then um, that's a bad option. We could take the theonomy option. In that case, we would fight to make sure that our laws and institutions and founding documents are all in conformity with God's Old Testament judicial and moral law. And by that means, we would seek to please God and know his blessings as a people. That view is complicated. It has a tendency to place works before faith as the key to the Christian religion. It has a tendency to do that, not always. And so there are difficulties even with that. We could take the evangelism option. In that case, we would seek to convert the nations to follow the directives of Jesus and his great commission. Go, baptize, teach them, and convert the nations. And if the nation is predominantly Christian, we would assume then that the blessings of God Almighty are upon her. We could take the this world is not my home option. This world is not my home option. In that case... We would remember that Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world and that those who followed him would be persecuted. And so we would embrace suffering knowing, you know, knowing that, um, knowing that it's coming and, and thereby set our hope on heaven and train our children to suffer without forsaking the faith. We could train them to be the persecuted but that option does not believe that scriptures talk, uh, that talk about God's blessing are anything but spiritual blessings, that they don't extend to actual nations, flesh and blood nations, right? It spiritualizes. So perhaps the best approach is the hybrid approach that doesn't see any single approach as the only approach. The theonomists need to talk with the evangelists. The Hezekiahists need to talk to the theonomists and on and on and on. And all these groups need to get together and talk about it. We need to have righteous laws and not only, um, and, you know, that derive from the only source of law, which is God in heaven. We need to live out our faith presently in a sense, not worry about 300 years from now. 
We need to evangelize so that the regenerate government leaders and regenerate business owners and regenerate people fill the nation. We need to set our hearts on things above rather than the things on the earth to genuinely long for Christ's courts in the new Jerusalem. We need to be the church praying for God's blessings upon a humble and meek people who will inherit the earth. Get militant about any of those ideas solely and we'll make a mess of things. And now having said all of that, the nation, the nation's rising and falling is a mystery of God's providence that we have not an ounce of control over. We don't have any control over whether the United States falls after the next several elections. If it's God's will, it will fall. If it does, we will suffer. And so there's a sense in which I commend just, rather than trying to figure out how we can coax God to be our God, is that we simply see striving and know that he is God. Whatever our situation may be, <clears throat> we should be content and faithful. If peace and prosperity, may we not forget the Lord. If poverty and hunger, may we not forsake the Lord. The destiny of the nations as the heart of the king is in his hands. The Lord looks down from heaven. Finally, the last section of the psalm returns to consider the gaze of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord, the protective eye of the Lord is on whom? It's on those who fear him. On those who hope for his loving kindness to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. And so as I think about my own heart and think about your hearts and think about the hearts of people I observe in the church, I think this is what is lacking in us as American Reformed Presbyterian Christians. We have become spiritual engineers who like to think about systems. We like to intellectually approach the Bible and approach the judicial laws of God like they are some kind of cookie recipe. We come up with systems for evangelism even. We, we publish and promote and market as good as anybody. And we have no fear of God. He is not our dread. As Pastor Halsey brought out last week from that passage in Isaiah 8. We do not fear the Lord. We sin brazenly and then fill our minds with thoughts of the grace of God. We rely upon cheap grace. We do not properly dread offending the God of heaven. So even if we had the opportunity to implement the laws of God in a newly constituted nation with an explicitly Christian constitution, I believe God would be pleased to destroy us instantly for our lack of fear of him. Lack of fear. With the fear of the Lord comes a corresponding humility. Right? And it's very clear we lack humility. How do I know we do not fear the Lord? Because we do not fear the lesser authorities that he's put in place over us. Right? Proof of our fear would be our fear of governors. Proof of our fear of God would be our fear of police officers. Proof of our fear of God would be fear of elders and fear of pastors and fear of fathers and fear of husbands. That would be proof of our fear of God because all those people stand in the place of God. But we have no fear of those things and so it's abundantly clear that we have no fear of the source of their authority, God Almighty. Those lesser authorities stand in the place of God. Our fear of him should lead us to a fear of them. Do I really have to prove at this late date that we stubbornly have refused to fear authority? I mean, have you watched Fox News? 
Have you watched CNN? Have you gotten on Facebook? Have you opened your ears and turned on any radio station? Do, do I have to prove that there's no fear of authority among us? If you don't see it, you're asleep. Do you, do you not see the fruit of this hatred all around you everywhere? And do you not feel it in your heart anytime you're, you're called out for the littlest failure? Come on. Come on. May God bless all of us with the ability to properly respond to authority, which means to properly know who he is and his authority and how it operates. Verse 20, <clears throat> our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Is that us? Do we wait for the Lord? Do we consider him our help and our shield? Do our hearts rejoice in him? Do we trust in him? Or is it that we find our trust and our help and our shield when we read Doug Wilson's latest blog post? Do we go to the Lord and pray for our nation. If we do not pray to him, then there is no way those things in verse 20 are true of us. If you do not cry out to him for our nation, if you do not fill your lungs with air and sing loudly, if you do not constantly awe at his creative power, then you do not think him to be your help and your shield, your, your trust, your praise. Brothers and sisters, where is our devotion to God? I fear that we are devoted to many voices, to many ministries, to many methods, to many techniques, but we're not devoted to Almighty God. Like the Israelites who go about saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. But never bow the knees of our hearts to the dreadful God who loves us. We listen to the voice of many of his prophets, but we never hear his voice. We get giddy about the gifts he has given, but leave off praising the giver. The psalm ends with a prayer, and may it be our prayer. Let your loving kindness that has said, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Now that's a difficult prayer, isn't it? It's the kind of, it's, it's like the Lord's prayer when we say, and forgive us our debts. Oh yeah, as we also forgive those who have sinned against us. It assumes that something precedes the Lord's forgiveness, which is our forgiveness of those who have sinned against us. In Psalm 33, the assumption is that we have hoped in God. The assumption is we've hoped in God. And as our hope has ascended, so we ask the Lord to bring up his mercy. But the proud and the arrogant do not hope in God. They have enough self-esteem and trust in themselves that they needn't hope. But the humble, the battered, the suffering, the weak, the broken, the sinful, the one who does not trust in himself but beats his breast and cries out to the Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He, he will be swimming in a, a sea of God's chesed, God's mercy. Through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, God the Father has become to those who have no hope in their own power, the Father of mercies. May our minds be set upon him and may we daily know and rejoice in the mercy of our sins being forgiven. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you praise this morning. We ask that you would listen to our prayer and take action. 
For your own sake, O Lord God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Lord, we ask that we might continue to be light and salt in the world. Lord, you have made your church to be a city set upon a hill. I pray that Trinity, through her love and service and prophetic voice, would shine your light into a dark and dead world. Father, it is so tempting for us to think that those outside the body of Christ have more than us, more riches, more enjoyment of life, more success. But, Father, we know that is a lie. It is your church that is the light And in the light, in the world that lies in darkness, we have you as our father, but the world has Satan as her father. Lord, I ask that we might find contentment in our knowledge of you and our salvation in Jesus Christ. Pray that you would keep us from casting a longing eye to the world and lose, and thereby lose our saltiness. Father, for all of us here this morning, I ask that you would have a specific mercy upon us. I ask that you would not allow bitterness to control our hearts and take root. As we live together as family, I pray that forgiveness and gentleness rather than bitterness would guide our hearts. Without question, there will be times when we sin against one another. When this does happen, I pray that we would remember the forgiveness we have from you, Father. Through Jesus Christ, guard us from bitterness against one another. May our love cover a multitude of sins. Father, I pray this morning for the new Geneva Academy. Continue to raise up men who are called to a life of ministering the preaching and teaching of your word. Lord, we need men of courage to bring health and life to your church in America. Raise them up by the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask. Father, I pray for the churches of Evangel Presbytery. Lord, particularly, I lift up the new work of church planting in Columbus. Lord, I pray that you would bless the Halseys with faith as they set out on these initial days of gathering a Bible study and meeting people and sharing your gospel. Lord, give them faith. Give them joy in the service of you. Give them joy. And may they they know your power and speak of it everywhere. Father, sanctify each of us here this morning. We know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, so sanctify us that our individual sins wouldn't spread like gangrene. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation only because of your work in us, Father. May we not hinder that glorious work through giving ourselves to sin. Father, we continue to pray for the West, and we ask that you would give Julie strength and healing after her miscarriage. Pray for Kinsey Howard and give her uh, strength and comfort as she approaches her due date. Protect the child in her womb. Father, we do thank you for the way that you've provided work for uh, the, the members of our congregation and that we have seen uh, the the needs of the church supplied for abundantly. And so we praise you for this provision, Father. And Father, we finally pray for our children, that they would grow in faith, that they would love you, that they would hate the world. And Father, that they would know the sweet peace of the knowledge of forgiveness of their sins. Thank you for your hesed. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Sleeping, 
thy presence my life be thou my wisdom O thou my true word I ever with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father I thy true son thou in me dwelling and I God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and 